I won't try to describe the situation we are in. Uh, I think we are all acutely aware. Uh, we are all affected, and we are looking for guidance to negotiate this extraordinary period. And I'm so glad to have with us uh, a fine mind with a global vantage uh, to talk about it. Uh, Kevin, thanks so much for joining us. First off, uh, how different will the post-corona global economy look like? Well, it's going to look very different. But let's remember, this virus, this pandemic, has partly been about accelerating, in fact, largely been about accelerating trends and forces that were already at work, as opposed to fundamentally new forces and trends. There are some, but vast majority of what we're talking about is really an acceleration. So if you think about some of the key features of the economy that will be different, we've long been talking about digitization. India has obviously seen the rise of digital commerce and the rise of digital business to business interactions. But what this virus has done is accelerated all of that. Weeks have become days and months have become weeks. It's been a very closely watched period in which because of the need to reduce the amount of human interaction, anything that is contact free has gained traction and really now I think has entered into a new phase where it becomes mainstream. That's the big difference. So the economy is going to look quite different. Its growth rate is going to look different. The role of digital is going to look different. There's going to be structural changes. I could go on. A very different economy, largely because trends that were already out there have been accelerated. Do you want to talk a little bit about what kind of uh, growth trajectory do you see um, for the global economy on the, on the path of rebound? Well, I'm happy to do so, and I'll do it with a lot of a uh, health warning, which is we've had a summer where we've explored the alphabet. If you recall, or for the, from a global point of view, and I know in India you're still working through the alphabet, but from a global point of view, the early part of the summer was all about will we see a V-shaped recovery? The letter V was the popular letter. Once we decided that a V-shaped recovery was not happening, and we can debate to the extent in which it's even relevant now, we quickly moved to decide and discuss whether or not there was a U-shaped recovery. In other words, it would take a bit longer. We'd be in this trough for longer. Then U became fat U because it became clear that actually it wasn't happening that quickly, this recovery, so we needed to elongate it. From U, we headed to V. Uh, we headed from V to U to W. W became next because we thought, well, maybe we're going to have two Vs, sharp down, sharp up. Then there's going to be a second wave, another down. But W came and went. And then we moved into shapes. We decided we could have check marks, sharp down, and then it'd be flat for a while. The Nike swoosh was actually quite popular for a period. The notion we'd have a, a long but steady upward trajectory. That's all given way. And today, I think the most popular letter in the alphabet is the letter K, not just because my first name begins with it, but because we've got this notion of a polarizing economy. Some parts going up, some parts going down. Perhaps really it's an X. We're at a crossroads. We're at a crossroads because it's pretty clear that this is now translating into a different set of economic impacts that look quite different in different parts of the world, largely because the health situation is now quite different in different parts of the world. And the extent to which different economies are able to combine saving lives and safeguarding livelihoods is also different. And that's why I think at best we're in a K, we may even be in an X. I'm, I'm glad we're on the alphabet because I'm, I'm very keen to find out from you what your uh, prognosis for the Indian economy is. We have been debating endlessly about V and U and Q uh, here as well. Um, what, what's your take on it? Uh, how are we looking? Well, I think one of the challenges that uh, many countries face is if you go down far enough, anything can look like a V. And perhaps that's part of the reason why there is still a discussion in India, which much of the world has left around. There's not much discussion of a V-shaped recovery anymore because we've been at this for so long. India obviously came later to the point at which the virus really started to gain traction and also has experienced a sharper contraction. I think I've seen numbers that suggest that this contraction between April and June saw GDP decline by close to a quarter, 23%, I think was the number I saw. That compares to 9% in the US, a much steeper decline. So given a steeper decline, small changes will start to look like a more accelerated return, but it's off a very low base. So it may be a bit misleading to talk about the letter V, but it is certainly possible that you will see big growth numbers coming in against what is a very low base. But the critical question isn't that. The critical question is how long will it take to get back to where India was or where the world was? And it's worth recalling when it comes to where the world was, our 
range of scenarios. We had nine different scenarios because we felt early in this pandemic, it was almost foolhardy to try and predict which scenario would come true. So instead, we looked at a combination of health factors and economic factors. For the world, we feel back then, the consensus, the area of most popular view was it'd be quarter three of 2023 before we would return to where the economies were in 2019. I've not seen much reason to change that view. I think when it comes to India, it's a bit early to, to have that view, but let's keep in mind where the globe is. And I'm skeptical of V-shaped recoveries anywhere, including in India. At McKinsey, you have this construct of the next normal. Um, can you take us through what that means and um, you know, what stands for that? Well, it's very popular to talk about the new normal. But the problem with talking about the new normal is it implies a steady state that we arrive at some destination and that's it. Our view is this is just but one more series of changes, dramatic changes. And I think that view has been in some ways proven because we're now experiencing different waves of this virus. So our idea was that there would be a next normal, a normal that would be subject to further change. And that that next normal, as I mentioned and you, KK, asked me, would be quite different than what had gone before. And the critical question is, what are the contours? What are the things that shape that next normal? And when we started to think about the elements that shaped, there were really seven that most came to mind. And those seven, I think, really started with the notion that distance is back. Distance is back. The idea that we had been through decades where people had talked about the death of distance because of what we're doing now. And in some ways, I'm actually today in Paris. Uh, you're in India. We're able to have a conversation. Distance is gone in that sense. However, big however, we're now seeing borders return right across the world. Physical barriers. Also distances back in terms of people's sense of people coming from far away and how they feel about that. Distances back in terms of attitudes towards global trade or even globalization. So one of the th consequences or perhaps one of the forces that's been accelerated is the return of distance. We think that's a key factor in thinking about this next normal. Another factor is the notion that we've moved from a series of economies that were built on just-in-time principles, the idea that we could deliver things just in time, supply chains, components, manufactured products would come together and be built just in time. Now what we've learned is resiliency really matters. Resiliency really matters. It's, it's a big problem if small parts of the supply chain go down and you can't produce them. I know that's been true in India. So I think we're moving from a just-in-time economy to a just-in-case economy an economy that has to take into account the very real possibility that once this pandemic is done, there'll be something else, maybe another pandemic, maybe some other shock. But just in time to just in, from just in case, just in time, sorry, to just in case, a big change. The rise of the contact free economy, that's another feature of the next normal. Digitization is one part of it, but think about business to business and the way in which businesses now operate, the way in which manufacturing operates, the way in which agriculture operates. Contact free is becoming important. I could go on. The main message is this, that we are going to go to something that is different from what we had before. It will be the next normal, but it isn't the end point. We're going to see continued change. I'm interested in hearing from you um, about what companies around the world are asking you when they turn to you for counsel. Um, what are their top anxieties? A lot of it is obvious. Uh, I'm particularly interested in hearing what are some of the non-obvious anxieties that you hear, um, hear about from CEOs and companies. Well, one non-obvious anxiety is what we're all experiencing is a health crisis and then an economic crisis. The two go together. And in that context, CEOs in particular have had to find different ways to lead. We often think about the imperial CEO, the CEO who's a big figure and tells people what to do and conveys a constant stream of confidence building messages and knows exactly what's coming. Any CEO who's doing that is clearly a very good Bollywood actor because it is impossible to keep that up when we're faced with continued surprises, when prediction really has proven impossible. And where in reality, what we're all doing is using lots of different points of data or information and talking to lots of people to craft a perspective on what comes next. And in that context, one of the key features I think I've seen CEOs do is display love, empathy, and social consequence as their key leadership drivers. That's very different. Love, 
I had a very hard nosed Silicon Valley CEO. He and I were doing a chat a bit like this. And at the end, he said to me, he said, you know, Kevin, I've talked to you about my strategy and how we're going to get through this. But the biggest thing I'm going to do is display love. I said, what are you talking about? Love isn't a word CEOs even use. And he said, well, we're in a health crisis, a crisis that bears an emotional scar and is taking its toll on our people day in, day out. What they, what people are looking for is understanding that you get it, that you understand how tough this is. You understand that lives are being lost. You understand what it means to be working in this environment. And that needs love and empathy. And so maybe that's surprising, maybe not. I think the best CEOs have probably always been able to blend those features. But I think we're seeing a very different style of leadership emerge. And I think a key part of it is this ability to really relate and understand what's going on and not just resort to the old management practices that are vital in terms of a normal society that we live in. But in this time, it's all different. To, to quickly, uh, very, uh, very, I mean, uh, uh, a message with a lot of resonance indeed. Um, to, to make a quick pivot from corporate leadership to political leadership, um, we have seen a b- broad range of macroeconomic interventions by governments around the world. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what are the ones that you've seen um, being effective and, and what are the ones that you think work? Um, what are the ones that you think people are wasting their time on and so on? I think it's very important not to pretend that there is one dominant axis of action that has been successful. Because in truth, if you look around the world, there's been very different approaches because they've got to be relevant in the context in which they're applied. In Hong Kong, people wear masks as a matter of routine. That occurred well before this virus hit. There was a certain sense of how one conducts oneself if you've got a cold, you don't go to work. You just don't do that. You don't brave through it and turn up. There's a belief that you should wash your hands and use hand sanitizer because people have lived through SARS. They know what happens. In that context, you can do a lot of things and get people motivated, excited, and committed to following those behaviors. Try putting them into a society that has a very different set of norms, and guess what? It doesn't work so well. But the basics do matter. I've been very struck by the UK government's simple messaging hands, face, space. It's hard to argue with that. Hands, wash your hands, keep them clean. Face, wear a mask, protect yourself and protect others. Space, keep the distance, physical distance. That, I think, isn't a political message. That's a message about what we know matters. Where you go from there looks quite different. And the big difference is actually once people accept this common set of actions on the health side is really the economic responses, which are quite different. You know, the United States has gone for an economic response, which in effect supports individuals once they've been either furloughed or made unemployed. The European Union is going for a response that supports companies to keep people in work and to ensure that people don't get made unemployed, at least not initially. Those are very different responses. Common to both has been a massive injection of liquidity or financial aid in the form of the packages that the United States deployed, the European Union deployed, India has deployed, many have deployed. And those packages continue to mount. So the scale of those, $10 trillion plus and counting, is unprecedented. And because it's unprecedented, we don't yet know whether it's working. What we do know, however, is that at least from an economic point of view, it could have been a lot worse. After all, this is a a challenge which is bigger in scale than the Great Depression, occurred faster than the global financial crisis, and has all the fear of 9-11. And yet, here we are, from an economic point of view so far, it's been kept reasonably in check at enormous cost and with real devastation too. But the health issue is the one that needs to be solved. And let's be clear, the economic issue follows the health issue. And that's where hands, face, space, and some of the basics matter. And then it's really a question of whether you can overlay on top of that testing and tracing and the contact exercises that have been successfully deployed in places like Korea, the way in which people have been able to control who comes in, who comes out, and ensure they're they're free of the virus, like in Taiwan. I can pick these examples, but because every situation and context is different, I think it's vital to just remember there are different ways of doing this. There's no one set of actions, but we have seen some that give us a pretty strong sense of what the basics include. Great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about turning adversity into opportunity. This, of course, is a time when a lot of companies, I mean, most companies we see, or I don't want to say most, we see a lot of companies trying to stay afloat, trying to you know ride out this crisis. 
Do you see the very best companies using this time as an opportunity to rebuild some part of you know, part of their business, reimagine some part, pivot in some ways, um, reinvent themselves in some ways? Do you see examples of those? Out of crisis often comes reinvention. And I really don't like the notion of people have won from a crisis because when it's so bad, so deep, and so many lives have been lost, it's inappropriate to even think about it that way. But it is true that in this moment, there have been amazing bursts of innovation. And we can see those, right? We can see, for example, the work that's been done on vaccine development. The fastest the world has seen a vaccine safely come to be delivered at scale is the mumps vaccine, which took four years. And here we are now talking about or contemplating having vaccines available in the space of one to two years, which is an incredible feat of innovation, of distribution, and also if it happens of access. But we're not there yet. But that's an amazing piece of innovation. The way in which many people have moved to work from different locations. This this event, which I know is a landmark event, which usually gathers people together, has been conducted seamlessly online. That's a piece of innovation. So I think, KK, there's been a lot of innovation. And I would draw an analogy with some of the darkest years the world has seen. If you take 1968, which was a time of uh, horrible racial issues in many parts of the world. In the United States, you had the assassination of Martin Luther King and the murder of Robert F. Kennedy, the two great leaders both murdered. You had the uh, race riots, you had demonstrations in Paris, you had all sorts of things going on. And yet in 1969, man went on the moon. We had uh, the launch of Concord and the Beatles published their greatest album ever. So you put all that together and you think, could 2020 be the prelude to 2021 being a year of innovation and progress? I suspect it may take longer because of the depth of what we're experiencing. But it is a true, it is true that we're seeing people enormously resourceful, developing creative ways to solve problems and finding new ways to work in the way that we're doing right now. And, and are there specific areas such as digital commerce, um, artificial intelligence and automation um, and so also analytics in which, uh, you know, your company does a lot of work as well. Are there specific areas of the modern economy where you're really seeing turbocharged uh, innovation? Are there, I mean, is there anything that you would like to uh, tell us about or, or take us through? Oh, I think all of the areas you mentioned are undergoing rapid shifts. And it's impacting in unexpected ways. One of the fastest growing categories I heard from a client I was chatting to are automated door openers. Nobody wants to open a door at the moment. They're worried. So guess what? There's been a whole raft of innovation around being able to wave your hand in front of a door and have it open or ensure that somebody opens it with gloves on. So there's been a rapid change in many sectors. It is true that the digital and analytics space is experiencing truly dramatic change. The amount of the degree to which we are working in that space has grown up exponentially for several reasons. One, the digitizing of processes is part of this resilience drive that many businesses, governments, and, and people are going to go on. We're going to automate a lot of things. Also, however, of course, analytics have come to the surface because when you can't plan, because you, the uncertainty is so high, a phrase I like to remind clients is, Planning is out and dashboards are in. Dashboards are in. So you want to keep an eye on the data. What's happening day by day? Real time, what changes am I seeing? And because of that, I think it is true that we see a large advance in the analytics arena, in the application of data. AI, yes, that's been boosted dramatically. Telemedicine, think about that. It relies on a lot of the dynamics that underpin artificial intelligence and making it delivered successfully and reliably. So these are examples of areas that are undergoing really strong growth. Many of the technology areas are in that camp, not all, but many. And that's why I think we are going to continue to see a real acceleration of forces that were already at work. We were talking about AI. We were talking about industry, industry 4.0 and so on. There was lots of language. The thing is, we now have it. We have it being deployed at scale right across the world. And that is a consequence of this desire to really digitize to remove some of the challenges with people getting sick and to support people in ways that draw on technology as an enabler. Lastly, I want to know, Kevin, um, is the office um, going to survive? Uh, the physical space is going to survive? Well, I think it will survive, but I think it'll be quite different. Um, I believe the office will survive for many different reasons. People like to be together. 
And I think we can sort of see that when different countries have had periods of feeling more confident than you know, people came back to offices, not in the same scale, though, and that's part of the clue. I think offices in many cases will shift to be places where you social, you socialize, you bounce ideas, you collaborate, not necessarily places where you, quote, go to work. Because one of the myths is people sometimes talk about going back to work in the same way they talk about going back to the office, as if people have not been working in recent weeks. People have been working really, really, really hard. Nobody's been shirking off. People have worked really hard. But the but is they've been able to do it remotely. And as that has proven to be possible, I think we've learned you can be efficient. And because of the efficiency, you can be productive. But it's not the same. And I think there is this need for social interaction to do some things together that will ensure people do go back to offices. But I don't think they'll go back to five days a week, fixed hours in the morning to fixed hours in the evening with no breaks in between uh, to go home. I think people are going to do a much more blended model. I'd like to think it'll be the best of both. There's a risk. It's the worst of each. There's a risk of people stay at home and remote working. There's a fine line between remote working and sleeping at the office because, you know, some people just got the bed behind the screen. That's not good. That's sleeping at the office. That's not remote working. So how do we have the best of both is the challenge. We're working on that one. It's not easy. But I think if we get that right, we'll have a much more flexible way of working that hopefully allows people of different gender, gives much more flexibility to folk who had raising a family and so on, and really has a better way of working. So best of both has to be the model. I don't think it's the death of the office, nor do I think we're going to 100% remote working. Kevin, um, that was really insightful. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really um, glad to have you with us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And I wish everyone, I hope you all stay well. And I hope I'm back in India soon. Take care. Thank you.